Now I'm sorry to say, but the sound is breaking up. You've tuned in to I Am Not A Number Live, the review show with Cardinal Sin and friends, where we review a different episode of The Prisoner starring Patrick McGuhan. Each week, we discuss a different episode and its implications then and now. Follow along and make sure to catch the episode in our viewing order so you can be ready to ask questions and participate in the chat. New episodes premiere each week on Wednesdays from 3 to 5 Central. The show's surreal and political implications on the reduction of the individual to a number have an even more insidious impact today, as all of our information, phone calls, texts, likes, photos, and other data are harvested to be sold and turn us into product rather than consumers. Get ready for a deep dive into one of the most important shows to have an impact on pop culture and society ever. And remember, I am not a number. Welcome, welcome, followers. It is I, Cardinal Sin, and I have with me today uh, Tracy Torme, who will be joining us shortly. And I would like to go ahead and introduce him now. And there he is. Hello, Tracy. Oh, and he's gone again. Let's check out who is in the chat. Uh, Hail, uh, Brian Hanish, who is the first one here. Harnish, I apologize. Um, Michael Beacom, always good to see you. Uh, Darius Munchausen is here. Hail, Darius Munchausen. The Stream Elements bot is here, but the Stream Elements tip jar is not. So if for any reason you would like to tip me, you may do so here at paypal.me slash gilbavell. It's 100% secure. I don't see your credit card information or anything like that. So that's a good way to go. If you'd like to tip me a buck or two or buy me a coffee or a pizza or whatever. Um, hello, Sherry. Greetings and hail William Schaefer and Andy Masterson. Hail to you, sir. And Darius Munchausen has showed you another way that you can tip me just by using that link there that's on the screen. You can also, of course, while we're waiting for Tracy to join us again, um, go to gillsstore.com where you will be able to find all kinds of great Cardinal Sin merch, including... this very handsome I am not a number sweatshirt awesome. welcome Tracy Torme yes I'm amazing I can spin myself all around without even using my arms can you guys see me okay Isn't that crazy this is you right here yep you're looking and sounding great the gremlins are out today. It's making it pretty tough. Yeah. Well, fortunately, we're here, and we have 
pretty good sized audience. There, yeah. There's no sound. Can you email it to my email? The phone. Won't I did. Work. I I did just before I we started. It's in your email. So Tracy, how are you doing, man? Gremlins aside. Maybe not so good. And in any case, uh, we are, of course, going to be checking out the episode Checkmate. The ninth episode in our series. And we are using the 50th anniversary Blu-ray set. Courtesy of Network. And boy, is it packed with goodies. You can also follow our viewing order along on Amazon Prime Video for free with ads. But, um, you know, it's remastered, looks great, sounds great. And there's Not Tracy. Coming. There I am. Yo, How are you, the sir? The sound isn't coming in at all. We can't hear you. Hmm. Can you, you email it? Email a new link. Sure. It won't work on this phone. Okay, thank you. One second, folks. Apologize for the audio issues. It's a one man show, so we're kind of producing on the fly, as it were. All right. And I am going to even go over here and share with you guys. Some of the stuff you can find at gillstore.com. There's all kinds of mugs and tumblers and t-shirts, oh my. And when you get down to a lower level, because I created them first, you can find, after all the midnight to midnight stuff, you can find yourself a sweatshirt. I am not a number, and on the back, of course, it has the channel URL as a thank you for buying and wearing a billboard for my channel. What else do we have? We have a pint glass. I'm not a number pint glass, which is very cool. We have an I am not a number coffee cup. And these are all at prices that basically I don't make any money from. It's just as a thank you for when somebody comes up and says, what's I am not a number with Cardinal Sin? And you can say, well, it's my favorite prisoner review show on YouTube. 
and the like. And of course we have t-shirts, And we have long sleeve t-shirts. Looks like we even have a black one. Wow, that's cool. I forgot I made that. <laughs> and uh, all kinds of other cool stuff. But you can definitely get your, uh, your merch on if you so desire here. And... That is, as they say, that. So, we are going to go ahead and move along into I Am Not a Number, number 10, where we're actually covering Checkmate, the ninth episode. Uno momento, por favor. And such is the life of a YouTuber. Uh, these are what the very handsome hoodies look like in real life. And they even come in white. I've been wearing this around the house because it's been kind of cold lately. And of course, on the back, there's that URL for helping me out. All right, let's uh, let's start to get into the episode checkmate. And before we do, we will say hail Ivan Ivanovich and hail Keely Chow. Good to see you. How do we know he's not Mel Torme? Yeah. That's pretty funny, Yvonne. I did not know that, Michael Beacom. Very interesting. So, uh, let's go ahead and get started with this episode. Um... When Rover's approach once more causes the villagers to freeze in place as first seen in Arrival, number six notices that he is not the only one still moving. An old man with a cane, number 14, George Caloris, limps on by, ignoring the bouncing white guardian. Rover leaves and the villagers resume movement. Intrigued, 
Number six follows the old man into the village courtyard where a game of human chess is being played. He is invited by the white queen, number eight, Rosalie Crutchley, to act as her pawn. During the game, he witnesses a rook, number 58, Ronald Rad, make his own move, check, in defiance of his command. Later, number two, Peter Wingard, a very good number two, makes his own move. Check. And later, number two escorts number six into the hospital where they witness the rook undergoing Pavlovian treatment via electric shocks to make him docile and compliant. This is being overseen by the sadistic psychiatrist number 23, Patricia Jessel. When number 58 is released from the hospital, number 6 reaches out to him to find an ally in his plans to escape. Number 58 is at first taken aback by number 6's authoritor- oh, bleh, I can't talk today. authoritarian air thinking he works for the village, but decides to assist Six in finding more allies. Number Six uses the chess strategy outlined for him by number 14, how do I know black from white? By their positions, by the moves they make, you'll soon know who's for or against you. One moment. Pardon me while we have some audio issues. Hail Canadian Spider-Man. Thank you for being here. And indeed, Michael Beacom is right. It's Tracy Torme versus YouTube, and YouTube is winning. I don't think Tracy's going to like that very much. So we will go back to our... Uh, let me try one thing real quick. We'll go back to the um, summary here. I just want to make sure they have the link again. And we are back. And if Mexican Iron Man has not seen the last 15 minutes, he can go and watch it, and we will wait. My Andre is not as good as Doomcox, but it seems to be serviceable, although I detect that mine has slightly more Bela Lugosi than Doomcox. Can you hear me now, Canadian Spider-Man? <laughs> hello, hello. Greetings and welcome Ivan Ivanovich says, I get the distinct impression that McGowan disliked psychiatry and psychology. 
in this episode, I believe he did say something about not liking uh, being psychoanalyzed or something like that. But the, yeah, there's a pretty strong theme of psychiatry and psychology that goes through this uh, this series. Darius Munchausen says, Bell Lugosi's dead and uh, forgets the even more rare B-side, Bella Lugosi's dad. His dad, his dad, Bella Lugosi's dad. Anyway, uh, let's get back to what we were talking about. So, meanwhile, number two moves against number six by brainwashing the queen, number eight, into falling in love with six. She follows him around with a locket, which she believes number six gave her, but which contains a tracking device matched to her heartbeat, which quickens in number six's presence. Number six's plot to escape involves radioing a nearby boat, pre pretending to be a pilot whose plane has crashed in the sea. When the time has come, he and his fellow prisoners invade the Green Dome and tie up number two. Number six then goes out to the boat in a raft to flag them down, but the boat he's been signaling belongs to the village and number 58 unties number two easily persuaded by number two's lie that six is a village agent working against 58 and the final image is of the butler walking up to a chessboard and triumphantly setting a final chess piece in place What makes this episode, originally titled The Queen's Pawn, such a pleasure to watch is its array of moving pieces, essentially staging an hour-long chess game, the central metaphor of human chess, always front and center. This is the only episode written by Gerald Kelsey, a veteran TV writer who also wrote For the Saints. which you can also get remastered in glorious black and white by Network. And there's another uh, box set exactly like this that has all the color episodes of The Saint. So get thee to the network. Uh, I think it's network.co.uk. Uh, or you can just put in the network and search on it. And boy, uh, you will find things to delight you that you never expected. So this is Peter Wingard. He is the new number two. And boy, is he a good number two. I think he's the best number two so far, except maybe for Leo McKern. Herc130 says, I am here, but I am driving, so I can listen but not talk. Well, I think Tracy might be in your car. <laughs> And uh, Stream Elements is programmed to uh, get you to try to tip me every so often. Because I programmed it that way. Or at least I had help. So. Onward. Ever onward. Uh, so it's written by Gerald Kelsey, a veteran TV writer who also wrote for The Saint 
and his script is exceptional, though it eschews the Magoon flavor of high-concept surrealism, which we just saw in Free For All. Don Chafee of Arrival returns to direct the location scenes. Magoon, uncredited, directed the studio scenes at MGM. This episode is a fan favorite and one of the most iconic thanks to its giant chessboard set out in the village courtyard. On an annual basis, prisoner fans gather in Port Marion to stage their own game of human chess. The episode dives deeper into themes established in Arrival, namely individuality versus conformism, the insidious methods of an authoritarian state, and the damaging effects on its citizens. And let's check in and see if we've gotten any messages or email from the Tormes. Uno momento, por favor. One moment.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have Tracy Torme with us. How are you doing, Tracy, despite the gremlins? <laughs> yeah, today has been a challenge. Um, doing well, Gil. How are you doing? I'm well. Um, um, how's Kansas? We definitely have some audio issues that we need to work out, but for now... Um, I just want to get your, uh, ideas about Checkmate. Um, well, Checkmate for me was an odd episode. Um, I, I like the concept of, you know, doing allegorical stuff about chessboard. I think that's really interesting. So I think there's a lot to play with there and so I, I kind of like the concept but for me it, I didn't think it was one of the better ex executed episodes um, occasionally the prisoner leaves you kind of scratching your head and I felt that way a bit about this episode it wouldn't be one of my favorites but I was actually interested to hear you recap the plot because I wanted to uh, hear your take on that. Because it's been a few weeks now since I've seen the episode. But um, are you going to do your recap? Yeah, I've been recapping a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I will continue. Okay. One of the ideas of the episode, suggested in other episodes, but made explicit here, is that number six acts with aggression and certitude of the village wardens making number six somewhat indistinguishable from say number two mm -hmm. this is why he can so easily imitate village authority when he strides around town with number 58 lobbing mm -hmm. accusatory questions at villagers to see if they react as guardians or as prisoners mm -hmm. and uh, a little parenthetical note that I made. Keep this in mind when Fallout comes around. <laughs> I thought it was an interesting take that his uh, authoritarian attitude actually ended up ironically betraying him into making the other prisoners think he was on the side of the Guardians. That was a nice twist. I, I kind of like that. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that when people do stories that are allegorical about chess, it's usually pretty effective because obviously the difference between the powerful chess pieces versus the pawns is certainly, um, you know, in play all the time psychologically in this series. So seemed like kind of a natural for a story but um, other than that twist where they think he's a guardian and that un undoes him ironically um, I didn't really like the rest of this episode that much um, and it's interesting because again you know Gil since it had been you know years since I had seen the prisoner before we started doing this show, it's bringing back a lot of interesting old memories to me. And I think that I did come away from the original series feeling like, well, you know, 70 or 80 percent of them are really cool and really work. And then there's about another 20 percent that it just doesn't seem to me that it really works. And this was one of those. I didn't really um, um, take to this episode that much. Um, that it's interesting that you mention that, Tracy, because mm. uh, it turns out that this is a fan favorite. People really, really like Checkmate. Wow. Surprised. Um, I also thought about that character of the... I guess it's the Butcher. Mm -hmm. I think he's in the original... Arrival episode, I think. Oh, the storekeeper. Uh-huh. Yeah, the storekeeper, right. 
he's seen, I guess, um, I don't know whether it was two or three times after that, but um, he was um, kind of interesting because I was sort of, you know, wondering which side he was on. Because I remember in the in the original time you meet him, he seems to be really entrenched with the way the island works. You know, he's part of the whole process of whatever it is to to you know be a storekeeper or whatever. And then in this one, you're sort of wondering, well, why is it that number six is tr- tr- um, trusting him so much? Because I remember when I first saw him again, I thought, oh, he's not to be trusted. But um, ultimately, that really wasn't the important key to the episode because yeah, I did think it was a clever thing when you find out that six, you know, um, ironically and unintentionally undoes himself by seeming to be authoritarian, which is um, the only way he could get that plot off the ground. So that was interesting, too. Um, But it's interesting, too, for me that I don't really remember this episode from, you know, from the old ones. Usually now when I see an episode, it'll come back to me. Oh, yeah. I remember this. Didn't really remember much of the checkmate, so maybe uh, for some reason I didn't really see it when it first was aired where I live. Um, didn't really feel like I know this episode. I was all sort of new to me. Um, I can't really explain that, but that's the way it felt. Well, Michael Beacon in the chat says mm-hmm. uh, to Tracy Torme kind of odd this one is one of the more straightforward episodes in what sense um there's no uh hypnotism or uh drugs or psychedelic you know uh weapons used against number six right no mind control elements exactly And uh, when it comes to answering your question about uh, why uh, number uh, eight is following him around like a puppy dog, uh, it's because number two has hypnotized her to be in love with him. So... That I guess is that's sort of the one element of mind control that right. is in there. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, but um, I wish I could be more uh, insightful about this episode. But um, well, I have some I, further comments that you might yeah. react okay. to. Great. Um. Let's see. Um, So his strong demeanor is his undoing. When number two tells number 58 that six, in fact, works for the village and 58 decides to believe him, but six would have lost anyway. As always, the village plays a rigged game, and the vessel to which he flees is the village's own, number two popping up on a monitor in the cabin to gloat, and Rover escorting the craft back to shore. I somewhat wish that the script had been rewritten so that the ship had truly been from the outside of the village and that number six would be undone solely by number 58's paranoid betrayal, which would have made for a cleaner checkmate. Mm -hmm. But as it stands, number six is checked by all sides. Only the love-struck number eight seems a bit useless for the climax's purpose, but she had a larger role in the climax in the earlier drafts. Oh, really? Yeah. 
And I'm, weird. I'm curious. Um, several times, um, our listeners have mentioned over time things from other drafts of other episodes. Where do people have access to the changes that were made in these scripts from early to late? I mean, where, where are they getting this? Um, where are they getting the, the fact that there were other previous drafts with other plot points? Well, that's that's from my research, of course. Oh, okay. Um, I I watched the episode twice. Once just to sort of soak it in, and then a second time on my uh, 50th anniversary remastered set uh, by Network, which is a wonderful remaster. And there's there's a lot of great details uh, in the extras there. Um his daughter uh, Catherine McGowan uh, appears and does some uh, uh, commentary. Um, does she look like her father at all? Um, a little. Um, there's a really good documentary called In My Mind that is a Channel 4 uh, 1983 attempt to interview uh, Patrick McGowan about the prisoner, but he ends up sort of directing it and telling... What do you mean? Well, he, he, he takes over. He, he tells the, the crew you know, where to put the lighting and, and, you know, and he, he starts talking and then he stops and says, oh, let's do that over. And then eventually at the end of the whole thing, he offers to buy all the footage they've shot and do it again, which they refused to do. So he made his own documentary and sent it to channel four and of course they didn't use that documentary they used the one that these guys shot but it it has a lot of uh interviews of uh Catherine McGowan and um I'll see what I can do about getting you a copy do you have a region free Blu-ray player? We do have a Blu-ray player, yes. Okay. It's a it's a region free one? I don't know that offhand, but I'll ask the warden. She'll she'll have the answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so earlier, uh, Ivan Ivanovich was saying that he feels like Patrick McGoon probably didn't think much of psychology and psychiatry. Yeah, I think that he's, um, I think he's kind of fascinated by it in some ways, but yeah, I think it's one of the sort of uh, cornerstones of society that he's pretty skeptical of and that he likes to take his pointed shots at. Yeah. That's true. And that's, you know, pretty consistent throughout the whole series I mean he uh, he definitely seems to have disdain for those authority figures in you know medicine and um, not so much medicine but more psychiatry he you definitely get that sense that he's very cynical about it um, thank God that McGowan was as cynical about you know the structures of power mm -hmm. because that's what really makes the series I mean, didn't have part of his own personality I don't think we ever would have had the prisoner so. well psychology and psychiatry are major themes in the prisoner and find prominence here with the cruel conditioning of number 58 mm -hmm. the psychiatrist actually name drops 
uh, Ivan Pavlov while she tortures number eight into picking the correct water cooler to slake his drug-induced thirst. And she also subjects number six to a word association game while psychoanalyzing him. And when number 14 is explaining human chess to number six, he says, quote, the psychiatrists say it satisfies the desire for power. It's the only opportunity one gets here, end quote. And note that... Interesting, the interesting guilt to um, look back to that word association um, thing that they do back and forth, because knowing the Guin, that was those words were probably very carefully chosen. Oh, yes. Um, do you have, you don't have a list of them, do you? I don't. But I remember uh, a lot of them were um, unusual. Some of them were sort of normal, but a lot of them were unusual. Um, I remember he does that uh, sort of sardonic comment about the, the, the pub where he used to drink. The Anchor and Steam, or whatever it was called, um, he gives a word response that is totally puzzling, and then he explains, oh, that's a place I used to, that's a pub I used to drink at, or something. Um, oh, yes, the, uh, yeah. uh, what was that? Um, I'm sure I'll, I'll uh, bump up against it here. I think it was the... The something in the lion, the hope in the lion, or something like that. Mm. Um, uh, so I noticed that Pop Goes the Weasel is referenced again. Yeah. This yeah, yeah, time, yeah. it's the tune on number eight's lips when she makes herself at home in number six's place. Mm -hmm. Number eight plays the white queen, and number six, her pawn. As others have pointed out, the White Queen is a character in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, mm -hmm. and the Queen's Pawn is the role taken by Alice. And the writer of this episode, Kelsey, based the human chess notion on a real-life German baron at a castle he had visited. Mm -hmm. Was anyone else surprised that the shopkeeper from the general store became part of number six's team of escapees? I was surprised initially. Now, this was the third episode to go into production. Kelsey, however, has stated his was the second script written, but fitting it in at uh, number three seems to make the most sense. And right now we're watching it as what, number eight? As number nine. Nine, okay. Yeah. And so what is, by the way, Gil, while I've got you, let me ask you, what is number 10? Uh, the, number 10, is, Hammer into Anvil. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put the viewing order into the chat here so that everyone can uh, follow. Mm -hmm. And so here we're looking at a picture of number 58 and number 6 being watched by number 2. And uh, my notes continue here. Um, as previously mentioned, Free For All includes number six's declaration that he will discover who are the prisoners and who are the warders, mm -hmm. which now becomes the plot of Checkmate. Mm -hmm. In the free association game with his psychiatrist, after she says free, 
he answers for all. This was his chant in Free For All, so perhaps it's still fresh on his conscious or unconscious mind. Regardless, the reference will be fresh on the viewers. And this is another episode in which it's pointed out that number six has only recently arrived. Number 14 says to him, you must be new here. And he must be because why does he randomly ask the queen who is number one? As though she of all people would know. He remains naive about how the village functions. Finally, the escape attempt in this episode is relatively straightforward on Six's part, which seems necessary for a very early prisoner episode, teaching the audience just how difficult it is to bypass the village's far-reaching powers by direct means. In Rob Fairclough's book, The Prisoner, he notes similarities between the, this plot and The Great Escape, 1962. Quote, A searchlight mounted in the village bell tower to look for escaping prisoners is iconography lifted straight from the visual grammar of the war film. Close quote. Now this episode aired 9th in the UK and 11th in the US, which is far too late given the above clues. The only advantage to watching it later is to strengthen what's otherwise a weaker run of episodes in the back half. Personally, I think that this was an episode that was written as one of those potential number two episodes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, also you want to talk about an innocuous question that I want to ask you and your audience. When number 58 was in, I remember thinking, what's the highest number they ever gave a character? 164 so far. 164 or 164? 164. Oh, okay. Because that sort of begs the question, too. How many people are on the island? What's the... How high does the number go? I mean, if you went from one to the last number, how many would there be? 300, 500, 1,000? I, I think I remember Rick Davey saying that there were around 200 villagers. Hmm. And... It, it seems like Port Marion couldn't really hold much more than that. Right. We wouldn't think so. Yeah. Right. Um, right. So, uh, Brian Harnish from the chat says, what I have enjoyed about The Prisoner is that it's just classic sci-fi done well. There is so much that's done with the writing and the storytelling. I'm sure that it's obvious to most who are here, though. So apologies for stating the obvious. No, he's absolutely right. And he says, uh, rather than uh, buying the... Uh, 50th anniversary box set uh, of the incredible remaster he says streaming does me just fine I'll wait for the 75th myself <laughs> yeah um, it's uh, you know um, Gil when you first talked to me about your concept of doing this show mm -hmm. um it was interesting because I sort of went back through memory lane in my own head and trying to think of various times that the prisoner has sort of reemerged into, you know, my focus. And certainly, you know, again, I always sometimes forget stupidly that not everyone was from Los Angeles like me. And right. I just kind of assume the way that we experienced it is the way everyone did, but of course it's not true. I'm much the same. In Los Angeles, 
after the prisoner had been off for quite a while. Um, then it reappeared with this <laughs> uh, angle they were taking where there was a psychiatrist who sat there by the screen with his dog by his side. They ran the episodes, and then the psychiatrist would talk about all the psychological uh, ramifications of the previous episode while he stroked his dog's head. And that ran him for a while. I guess it's, again, probably only in L.A. I don't know anyone else, else ever experienced that. But that was sort of like the reemergence of the show after I hadn't seen it in many years. Got me thinking about it again. And that sort of seems to happen to me every so often, every, I don't know how many years. Then, of course, the, uh, the hideous remake miniseries of Prisoner came along. And, um, but now your show, of course, is a great chance to um, reinvestigate it. It's kind of cool for me because um, there are certain episodes, like the Schizoid Man, which I've mentioned is my favorite, mm -hmm. that I remember very well. And then there's others where it almost feels like I'm seeing them for the first time because I just don't really remember them that well. Checkmate would be one of those. But. It's just interesting how this show has such legs in a way that, you know, depending on what years it reemerges, whatever's really going on in society at that time is going to have a new sort of angle on the prisoner. Like I think right now we're in a time period where it's really applicable to the prisoner. I mean, you know, I think... McGoon would have had a field day if he was seeing what's happening with society right now. Um, and uh, along those lines, one other thought. Um, I think, you know, when, when people are these days doing a lot of comparisons to George or Orwell and his various writings. It's and funny that you mention that. I just watched the 60th anniversary a version of Animal Farm. Brilliant. And, uh, well, you know, it was... Is just a master of talking about the way that language could be weaponized and used for whatever purpose, you know, it, it uh, it, uh, is, is trying to achieve. And certainly for me, I believe, Right now, in like American politics, that is so true now that things are, not only is language weaponized, which it has been, but also if you're trying to get a certain result on something, then you use language to achieve that result, whether it has any logic behind it at all. So that's happening all over the place now. Uh, it's a scary part of society now, I think. And it's something, again, I think McGowan would have absolutely relished being able to um, point it out in his usual way. I think this would be a great time for the prisoner to be remade, but only if it's done right this time. On the other hand, if you're trying to do the, redo the prisoner, where are you ever going to do that's better than Port Marion? I mean, that's just the, such an unbelievably perfect place for this series to have been done, and not instead inside of some studio somewhere or whatever. You know, I, I think, sets. Tracy, that um, remakes and reboots and all that kind of stuff, uh, it's it's all Hollywood can do these days. They don't have an original thought in their head. Yeah, that's very true too. And yes. with the continuing remasters, uh, you know, um, this one's in 1080p and uh, Dolby Atmos. Mm -hmm. uh, never mind 5.1 surround. Uh, it's it looks like it was made yesterday. And I think that the the point that you're making is that it's 
it's more topical today than it was ever. I absolutely think that's true. And you know, before the the um, the run of shows on I'm Not a Number has run out, it might be interesting to you know open it up to the audience and ask what are things that are going on in today's world that are specifically um, perfect for the prisoner like the use of language is one but there's many others and um, I think when McGowan first you know created the show and it was first on the air it was you know speculative science fiction it was sort of like uh yeah, it was obviously doing some great allegories, but it was also sort of, um, I wonder if the world could ever really be like this, in, except in <laughs> Goon's mind. Now, <laughs> I think it, it's proven that it is. Yeah. Um, you know? And uh, even just the, the simple idea of numbers and people being sort of slavishly controlled by their social security numbers and their cell phone numbers and on and on um he was very prescient you know he knew in his own mind kind of what was coming i think prescient is a great word for it Mm -hmm. and we do have some comments in the chat uh one from michael beacom um and one from rob altis And what he says is, what I love about the prisoner streams is that I get a different perspective and great insight by very astute people. And uh, thank you, of course, Rob Altus. Um, And Brian Harnish says, I just love this series. Canadian Spider-Man says, Tracy is fantastic. Um... Brian Harnish agrees with Canadian Spider-Man. He says, I love Tracy's insights. And uh, Ivan Ivanovich uh, from the chat says, one could only marginally improve on this series. The opportunities to do damage to it, however, are legion. Yeah. I know I've uh, been pretty clear in the past of how horrified I was by the the remake um i i i remember again i don't want to beat a dead horse but i remember when i heard they were doing the remake and i think i told my agent when i heard about it god i would do that for free i you know would love to work on something like that so i was really curious to see what they would do with the new show and i assumed well they'll have better special effects and things like that but God, I mean, I was like halfway through. I don't remember if that was like a six hour or something, a four hour. A it was a hour. limited series for sure. It was torture. I, I just couldn't. I was angry. I was like, not even did I not think that really worked. I, I'll tell you something, Tracy. I, I don't know if I've told you this before, but I couldn't get through the first episode. I walked out yeah, during the first terrible. episode. Yeah. It just didn't have any any of the things that all of us that are fans, you know, relished. They were all gone. They were trying to make some kind of weird statement with it, but it wasn't working. And again, I remember the only other remake that's come close for me to that abysmal of an effort was uh, Dave Earstead still. I mean, that was another film that... Oh, God. What a yeah, horrible movie. Great. And the, you know, the follow-up was just awful. You know, so, when when people yeah. say, let's remake that or this movie or that TV show, my response is, just remaster it and put it back in theaters. You know? Mm-hmm. There's no, like, if somebody wanted to remake Forbidden Planet, I would go for their throat. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Just oh. remaster it. Make sure that it looks great and sounds great and put it back in theaters. Make it a yeah. one day fathom event or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, you know, A&E ran The Prisoner in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, they 
were the ones that made the uh, the 30th anniversary uh, remastered set, uh, the 40th anniversary remastered set. Um, uh, don't remember who made it. Um, you know, also, Gil, I was thinking um, we talked about that wonderful experience that I had my one day with Patrick McGowan mm -hmm. and how uh, gracious he was and how cool he was but now when I started recalling that when you and I were talking about it on the show you know that's again something I haven't really thought about that much or not that um, precisely in years so it was taking me back to that experience I started really kicking myself, thinking, why did I never try to follow up with him and reach out to him again and say, you know, there's a few things I forgot to ask you or a few things we didn't discuss. And I was sort of wondering, why didn't I do that? But I think the reason I came up with in my own mind was I was so awestruck by just that one day with him mm -hmm. and being able to sit there one-on-one -on -one with him and uh, kick things back and forth that I think I felt like I don't want to do anything to spoil that. That's you like just want to soak it up. Yeah, it's a perfect memory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, that um I was very lucky to have that experience with him, and as I, you know, explained, it was my uh, secretary's um, fortune of having worked on Columbo and knowing him from that. Mm -hmm. And um, she heard somewhere what a fan I was of the show, and she surprised me by saying, "You're a big Patrick Lagoon or Prisoner fan, aren't you?" I said, "Oh, you know it, you know." And then she said she could set this up. And I kind of think that I was thinking, oh, that's kind of pie in the sky. That'll probably never happen. And then she kind of sprung it on me one day with a, you know, Cheshire cat grin on her face. There's someone <laughs> on the phone who wants to say hi to you. And I picked up the phone not knowing who she was even talking about. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there he was. And... Uh, incredible I mean the guy was um, you know the guy was the real deal I mean what he you know put forward in the series The Prisoner you know kind of showed what a deep thinker he was yeah and what a, an uncompromising guy too I would imagine that you know given what I know about Hollywood and its ways anytime he did do projects that were crossing over with Hollywood like by Station Zebra and things like that um, they had better be on their toes and be respectful to him he's not just going to go off and do what he's told you know yeah. he's the ultimate individualist and um, by the way I, I wanted to mention I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you before or not but Rick Davey and I decided when I Am Not a Number has run through all 17 episodes uh, for a uh, an encore, if you will, uh, we're going to review and discuss Ice Station Zebra. And that's available to watch on Amazon Prime. You have to rent it. It's like two ninety nine. But yeah, I, know that film, I know that film quite well, so uh, that'll be fun. That'll be fun to do that. Yeah, um, we would definitely yeah. love to have you there. Yeah, um, I've got an old friend that was such a fan of The Prisoner that we used to sort of bond on that. We used to always be talking about we didn't get to see each other that often but boy he would love this show and the problem is his phone number is in a 
Uh, an old phone book of mine that's in storage right now. It's the only place I know how to reach him. So I'm going to try to figure out a way to do it because... To reach who? What's that? To reach who? This friend of mine. Oh. Um, he's an actor, actually. We gave him a, a small part in Carnival, one of the Carnival episodes. And uh, he just loves The Prisoner. So I've got to make him aware of this. Find a way to get to him. But uh, um, I would also um, wonder if I could ask your audience, is there anyone out there who saw the episodes of The Prisoner when they were screened with that psychiatrist and his dog? Am I the only one that even knows about that? Does anyone in your audience know about it? No, know about the psychiatrist and the dog? Yeah, that was how they brought the series back. It was called The Psychology of the Prisoner. It was on, I think, it was on the PBS station in L.A. Mm. And they would run every episode, one after another, like we're doing. And then he would sit there and do a psychological analysis of what the episode was. Oh, right. Yeah, it was interesting, but... uh, yeah, I wonder if I'm the only one that even knows about that in this audience. So, if anyone knows it, shout out. Let me know. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'm going to add the TV show because I'm getting a lot of things about the... Uh, the uh, Stanford experiment. I'm sure I know about that. Um, learning this? and self counseling through television entertainment. Hmm. What the prisoner can teach us about life in lockdown. Hmm. Um. All the Mad Men, exploring the Prisoner TV series. Um, Bars of social allegory, walls of psychological realism. Seems like there's a a lot uh, that comes up. Um, I don't know if this is the one that you're actually talking about. Um... No, because this isn't a documentary, it's a book. Hmm. It's about uh, teaching sociology and uh, the this particular chapter is called Learning and Self-Counseling Through Television Entertainment, The Prisoner. Hmm. Um, I do find the, uh, the one about... Uh, um, what the prisoner can teach us about life and lockdown, I think that's very interesting. When did that must have been pretty recent that came out? Uh, March 22nd, 2020? Yeah. In uh, The Guardian. Oh, okay. And I'm going to put that up on the screen there so that people can see it. Uh, more than just a number, what the prisoner can teach us about life in lockdown. And there's a, a actually a photo of Patrick McGowan uh, on the chessboard. He's he's got his uh, his stick with the pawn on it, and he's got you know the colored uh, sort of jaunty thing that goes on one shoulder. Um. And uh, it's likening uh, what number six does to what we should do during a lockdown. The first one is take up a hobby. The second one is do some exercise. The third one is take a long, hard look at yourself. The fourth one is get to know your local area. 
The fifth one is plan your next trip. Number six is expand your mind. And I think number six is fittingly the last, the last one. Very interesting, though. There's, uh, I, I could read the entire page, but what I'll do is I will just put the, uh, the URL into the chat so people can read it because it really is very interesting. I'm I'm not familiar with any external, um, you know, book or uh, guide to the show that discusses that. But because it never really even hints at it in the show, does it? So far, that that's not really the point of the show. Right. But so far, in our nine episode watch, um, we have discovered that he's said among other things that it was because of morality and he also said because it weighed on his conscience so it, i think he said that it was a an action of conscience or something like that You you should see the uh, the documentary in my mind. Uh, it's it's really more a documentary about these guys trying to interview Patrick McGowan about the prisoner, and and him just taking it over and getting not really upset or angry, but sort of exasperated <laughs> and. I, I think that even though he was being paid to do it, I think that it was, as you've said before, and as Rick Davey has said before on many occasions, that if you have to ask him questions about the prisoner, you didn't get the prisoner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like the, the occasion when he was in your office at Paramount, and you asked him about who is number one. And he gave you that sort of coy, vague answer. Right. Do you remember what the answer was? Um, the answer was a bit befuddling. It wasn't meant to be very clear. But when I thought about it, I got the impression that number one was actually him. And that the entire episode on the island and everything that he went through was kind of like his alter ego's way of keeping himself honest by putting him through all these things. Now, that's my interpretation of what he told me, but I can honestly tell you it was really my interpretation because... His answer was as ambiguous as the series is. You know, he wasn't... But he also acted like he did know the answer. It's like he knew exactly what it was. He wasn't going to spell it out for me. But it's like a puzzle. And if you can reach the end of the puzzle, you'll sort of see what I was doing. That's kind of what I remember. I think I remember Rick Davey saying that... Uh, 
one's self is the prisoner. Uh, the id versus the ego. Right. Uh, the individual versus the state or the authority figure. Uh, that number one represents uh, everything outside the individual, which is a bit solipsistic, but I think he meant in the sense that because one can never really escape from the island, that number one is really the id of one's self. And we have some more messages to read here from the chat uh, before I go back to my commentary here. Uh, Rob Altus uh, says, I have Ice Station Zebra on DVD. And... Michael Beacom says, Ice Station Zebra, yeah, get it on Blu-ray. Um, and back when we were talking about, you know, how to remake it and that kind of thing, uh, Michael Beacom said, Tracy, I, I knew that the remake of The Prisoner was a loss the minute they did not film it in Port Marion. It is just as much a character as number six. Very good point. And Slider's fan blog from the chat says, I think in many ways the prisoner is an allegory to the encroaching world government. It's already here and continues to overstep its bounds in every way imaginable. And Michael Beacom says at Cardinal Sin, right. First question is, why are you remaking it? And he says to Slider's fan blog, you are not wrong. I got to talk to Ray Bradbury about Fahrenheit 451, asking him if he felt prescient about his predictions. And he said, quote, don't blame me. I tried to warn everyone, close quote. Uh, we have a couple other comments. Michael Beacom says, I recall someone coming on to talk about the prisoner at the end of each show in PBS in Nebraska, but I don't recall him having a dog. And I think um, Rick Davey mentioned this guy was in maybe the New York market or the Cleveland market. I don't, I don't remember. Um, and uh, hail to P. Ferreira. Um, and thank you to Brian Harnish for explaining the uh, audio situation. Um, And uh, P. Ferreira says at Darius Munchausen, one of my moderators, I couldn't miss seeing or hearing Tracy. So you have a lot of fans, Tracy, oh, in the you. chat. Very nice. Thank you. Um, and P. Ferreira goes on to say, I just wanted to say to Tracy, I consider sliders in my top five favorite TV shows of all time. Very nice. Thank you. Um, the Sliders fans are uh, amazing to me that they, as I said to you a long time ago, Gil, they're willing to uh, have put up with all the nonsense that the network and the studio put them through. They almost made it impossible to stay with the show. I wouldn't have stayed with it. I was out there, but yeah. Um, yeah, but people have been incredible about it ever since the beginning, so. Another uh, comment from Brian Harnish in the chat, 
says, Thank you, Tracy, for creating the best show on TV, Sliders, at that time in this particular universe. <laughs> influence on you even unconsciously we have another comment uh, from Stephen Amore he says how do dad worked on some of the prisoner Patrick told him that he and a co-writer stayed up all night to rush write the last episode as they didn't have an ending episode in Checkmate when number two who's played very well by Peter Wingard uh, is meditating and does the karate chop on the yeah. block of wood yes yes I do what yeah. did you make of that Yeah, I think yeah. Peter Wingard is is uh, the prototypical number two, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, Slider's fan blog in the chat asks, do we assume there will be a prisoner homage Slider's episode? <laughs> oh, you know what? I mean, the, the, the simple answer to that is there are homages to the prisoner in a lot, a lot of different Sliders episodes um, they were always in there mm-hmm. um, and uh, so whether there'll ever be one that you know becomes that overt I don't know about that but yeah uh, Patrick's vision was always etched in my mind when I was doing sliders so um, you know um, be interesting for me one day to look back at all the Sliders episodes and see where the little prisoner touches were. But I know there were a lot of them. Because I was... Uh, and that's true for my Star Trek work, too. I mean, I, I, I definitely think that if there was one series ever that influenced more than any other, me and my work, more than the prisoner, I don't think there would be one. Because I think person would be number one um and partly that was also because you know i came to believe very early when i started working in hollywood that the um, amount of conformity in hollywood was really frightening Mm -hmm. so whenever anything came along that showed you know some initiative and some you know, unusual imagination. 
that always really stuck out stuck out in my mind and the prisoner was that way to me from the very beginning I mean I just thought this is just whether you like it or not it's unlike anything really you've ever seen before especially Gil when you consider it was originally a summer replacement series on CBS so you just wouldn't expect anything that that's those two things to ever be very original and yet here came this thing out of the blue and people were just stunned you know I mean I oh think yeah it's one of the reasons why, by the way why it didn't initially probably become that popular it was just too out there. It was too off the radar screen. People might say, oh, that was a trip. Wasn't that wild? But did they get in the habit of watching it every week while it was on CBS? Probably not. Um, and, you know, if it had become, you know, overtly commercially popular, it probably wouldn't be the series that it is. It certainly wouldn't be. So it couldn't be that. It had to be a bit iconoclastic, you know, mm-hmm. to um, yeah, to have the lasting impact that it's had, and um, yeah, it was just like a bolt of uh, lightning. People didn't. I remember when it first aired, you know, talking about it with some friends of mine or whoever I knew that had seen it, and it was even hard to. Um, have you know intelligent conversations about it because it was just off the radar screen totally you know sort of out and of left field huh yeah well, absolutely and that's uh, why I think why we still do shows a show like we're doing now it's just um, you can't really complain it can be compare it with anything I, I want to read some more um, messages from the chat but before I do um, I wanted to ask you if you were aware that J. Michael Straczynski is going to be remaking Babylon 5 for the CW network. No, I didn't know that. Um, I have a very good friend who's a guy named Ed Wasser, he's an actor. Mm-hmm. He was a character called Morden, I think, in that series. Mm-hmm. And uh, he... Um, I still see Ed all the time, and uh, if it wasn't for Ed, I gotta be honest, I really wouldn't know anything about Babylon 5. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure that I've ever seen an episode. Well, um, it's been remastered, and it's available to watch on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can buy seasons, or you can uh, rent an episode. It's, of course, much more... Uh, financially feasible if if you're going to watch more than one or two episodes to mm-hmm. to buy seasons, but um, do you recommend I, it? I'm sorry. Do you recommend it? Oh yes, oh yes, yeah. And it it's interesting because Babylon Five was a program that along with um, Back to the Future, the movie trilogy, that the creators said were never going to redo this or allow it to be remade. No one's ever going to option it. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to me that at this time, you are working on a continuation of Sliders and J. Michael Straczynski is working on sort of a a remake of Babylon 5. Uh, what he's said about it uh, is that it's going to be, I think, a little more mature and it's going to incorporate more of today's um, or, or the culture in the intervening years uh, because, gosh, the, the 20 years that it's been off the air or, or however long it's been have 
you know, had a very serious effect on science fiction and pop culture. Um, P. Ferreira from the chat says, uh, I used the lockdown to rewatch the entire Sliders series from beginning to end. I held off for years watching season four and five because of how it turned out, but summoned up courage to finally watch seasons four and five. Stephen Amore says uh, of Patrick McGowan that he used to rest on a table in the studio between scenes. Dad was an engineering apprentice at the time who kept pestering Patrick to sign photos. Turned out he was selling them in the local pub. <laughs> um, uh, Rob Altus mentions Lost and uh, that it felt as if the last season was not planned very well and seemed to be directionless. I, I couldn't get into Lost at all. I tried twice watching six episodes and I was just like, fuck this. This is not for me at all. Um, and Stephen Amore says, Peter Wingard, a great Clytus, and one of his last roles was in an episode of The Two Ronnies. He was excellent. Uh, P. Ferreira, this might answer some of your questions, uh, says, having rewatched the show, I'm a little less hateful towards season three. It's watchable, just not sliders. And goes on to say season four was a chore to sit through because the budget meant most of the episodes revolved around the hotel rather than exploring the earth they were on. Season five had its moments of being okay. Michael Beacom in the chat says, Cardinal Sin, I first recognized the name Peter Wingard from Flash Gordon, Clytus, where you never saw his face. What a great voice. It wasn't till I rewatched on VHS that I realized it was him. And uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, Canadian Spider-Man says he likes the disco ball light effect that I have going on. Uh, P. Ferreira says... Are there any of the original show writers involved with the reboot? People like Non Hagen, Steve Brown, Tony Blake, Paul Jackson, Scott Smith Miller, etc. Ela Horowitz's first two episodes were good as well. Um, the only previous writer that is currently involved in. Uh the Sliders reboot would be Jacob Epstein. So, no one that P. Ferreira mentioned at all? Uh, not yet. Um, not yet, but that doesn't mean you know, that may not happen in the future. Um, and but, this, uh, this is something you can probably address, Tracy. Hmm. Uh, Brian Harnish in the chat says, the professor's death in season three affected me a great deal at the time. I loved John Reese Davis in Sliders and wish his character didn't have to go out so horribly. Do you have a, a comment or an answer about that? Yes. Um, John, John, the character of Professor Arturo would never have left the show I had my druthers. It came from uh, Fox deciding that the show was skewed. They wanted to skew the show to a younger audience. Mm -hmm. And their two main ideas for that were to have people with backwards baseball caps um, skateboarding around in the background on many scenes. <laughs> Didn't matter what it had to do with the story. And that Reese Davies was too old, and they needed to get a quote-unquote hot chick to replace him. Right. So 
thus Carrie Wurrer. Yes, yes, it certainly was. Or Kari, uh, I guess. As far as you're concerned in the reboot or the continuation, that will be not canon. Absolutely. So we may see him return? He may. Very good. He lives in the the Isle of Man now. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, great. Um, and uh, I found out that someone sent me something one time. It was an interview with Kelsey Grammer. Mm-hmm. And they asked him what his biggest regret was in show business. And he said that he, did, that he didn't get to play Professor Arturo. And uh, so Kelsey Grammer was really interested in that part. I didn't even know that because it would have been interesting for us. Um, we went through some interesting collection of actors who, for a little while, it looked like might play the part of Arturo, and he would have been interesting in the mix. But um, yeah, John's uh, but the professor is you know in, integral, integral. I'm not even coming up with the right word. A um, key part of the whole show. I mean, he he brought a lot of stuff to the show. I agree. So I yeah. I uh, am such a gushing fanboy of Sliders. Um, I remember it being appointment television. You know, back when uh, all you could do is record an episode on a VCR. Mm-hmm. Um, back when we had three networks and a UHF station, <laughs> um, I was sat in front of that TV every week to watch Sliders. Uh, Sliders fan blog brings up something interesting. Jerry O'Connell was a director slash producer in season four. He told me that he wanted to put some original sentiments in some of the season four episodes that were from the original seasons. Any what does he mean any thoughts about that? Sentiment? What do you mean? I don't, I don't think I understand that. Original sentiments. What do you mean by that? Um, uh, Sliders fan blog. I, I'll ask you to uh, uh, rephrase or or to. Uh, um, make your question more uh, concise we'll move on to some other ones here before we do that um p ferreira says jacob epstein was great i feel he often gets ignored when talking about the show and goes on to say am i allowed to ask a controversial question why was Jacob Epstein fired from Sliders by John Landis? He was asked in an interview, but he wasn't sure why Landis didn't like him. Is um, this after your tenure? No, no, it wasn't. I'm still there when they fired Jacob. Um, the only real answer I would have for that is I don't remember that it was Landis who didn't want him around. I thought it was more a network decision, but Mm -hmm. maybe there's something I don't know about. Um, But, um, yeah, no, so um, it's interesting the person that asked the question about that half dozen writers or so, Mm -hmm. they obviously really know the show well. Yeah. Because they named some, you know, people that aren't necessarily remembered for it. Um, But um, I wish I could be a little more definitive with your audience about, you know, where, 
we stand on the reboot. Um, there's a few things that need to get sorted out because once again, there are certain people that are in charge that I don't want to be in an endless sure. battle with like I did throughout the whole life of the series. Um, gets exhausting after a while. Uh, um, P. Ferreira also asks, mm -hmm. when John was still on the show, there was hope that the show could still be redeemed. When he yeah. left the show, it could not be saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. That's uh, one of the main reasons the show went south. Um, not the only reason, but um, yeah, it, it's, you know, I have really bittersweet feelings about sliders in general because uh, it was so much like my baby originally and I uh, spent so much of my life on it but then on, again uh, the uh, hazards of doing that show um, which could you could sort of boil it down to its simplest which would be that when you don't have a network and a studio that you're working for um, having your back it makes it difficult and I just remember for whatever reason, I think the original reason that the network weren't fully, in, you know, behind us in sliders, they were really uncomfortable with the fact that we mixed sort of black comedy and sort of social comedy with science fiction. They felt... You have to do one or the other. It's been the bane of the showrunner uh, of science fiction since, uh, gosh, Rod Serling, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, well, I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Um, I did what with Rod Serling? Say again? I, I didn't hear what you, what you said before you brought up Rod Serling. Oh, that it's it's been the bane of the existence of the showrunner in science fiction since at least Rod Serling. Well, you know, what I may have done wrong is I was just, you know, stubborn that it could work being more than just one thing. And I remember when the pilot aired as a two-hour movie, it got really shockingly great ratings. Right. And I remember the network sort of being confounded, like they weren't expecting that. So from that point on, they sort of renewed us every year reluctantly. Mm -hmm. And we had to climb the mountain over and over again to um, be able to do the show we wanted to do. And... Um, you know, I've, I've talked about this, you know, several times, but it's, uh, it's a shame, and that's one of the reasons that I am intrigued with the idea of doing the reboot, um, to sort of pick up where I sort of left off in the middle of the third season. Yeah. Um, and hopefully it will, it'll happen, but we're just going to have to wait and see. Just uh, looking for a good home for it. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, and uh, once channel, once again, that. I'm going to recommend Stars because uh, when Rob Taper and Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell were shopping around Ash versus the Evil Dead, <laughs> Stars was the 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 network that when they asked will you let us do what we want to do they replied you can do whatever you want and that sounds like nirvana and that's what they did they stuck with stars for three seasons and uh i don't know if you've seen it or not i don't know if you're an evil dead fan but 
Um, it even answered a question that I was going to write to Sam Raimi before Ash versus the Evil Dead aired and recommend a story for Evil Dead Zero because in the first Evil Dead Bruce Campbell's character Ash plays a tape recording of uh, the professor I guess um, uh, reading from the Necronomicon and just playing the tape is enough to summon the the demons and that kind of thing. So if you think about it, Evil Dead Zero would be the story of the professor and what happened when he read from the book when he was recording it. And they answered it in an episode of Ash vs. the Evil Dead. And I was so pleased, not with myself, but just that they did it. Um, there's another... Uh, Sliders fan blog has uh, clarified the uh, statement and says, I believe Jerry was referring to satire slash sci-fi instead of all-out action scenes. Does that make that's sense? Yeah, that's good to hear that Gary wanted to go in that direction. Good. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it became difficult to do the straightforward science fiction once the Chromags became sort of unintentionally comical characters. Yeah, they became like the, the Klingons. They were the... Klingons, I used to call them Klingons with bad teeth. Yeah, they were the... Yeah. The bad guy of the week. P. Ferreira in the chat says, Since this will be my outlet, I just wanted to say, just my opinion, that the five best episodes are Double Cross, The Guardian, Dead Man Sliding, Prince of Slides, and Season's Greetings. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because he likes a lot of the later episodes, which is unusual. Um, I don't hear that off very often, but, um, okay, interesting, okay. P. Ferrer goes on to say, at least Tracy can feel okay. Those episodes I mentioned impressed me, so it wasn't all bad in the end with se the episodes in season three. Um, That's good to hear. Michael Beacom says, it's 5 p.m. and unfortunately I have a spouse waiting for last minute Thanksgiving shopping. You guys have a great Thanksgiving or whatever you may celebrate. Be seeing you. So thank you, Michael Beacom, for being here. Uh, Brian Harnish says, I think that Netflix and Hulu would be good options as well for the Sliders reboot. A deal with them may be able to allow the entire freedom of control. And I believe in a previous... Um, it might have been an episode of Masters of the Genre, Tracy, that you said uh, that you were looking for a home for sliders uh, that would give you both uh, creative control and also where the rights wouldn't be an issue. And I, I think you mentioned that Peacock might be the potential home. Mm -hmm. um, that's what makes it complicated and a bit confusing um, And uh, but I'm going to take that uh, Netflix suggestion to heart mention it to um, Daniel Clayman who's the ex-Fox executive that's now sort of spearheading bringing this back I'll mention that to her because it sounds good Netflix has um, saved a few series um, so has uh, Amazon 
But one thing you should be careful about Netflix is that after three seasons, they tend to cancel a show. Because I guess they think that the money's, you know, no longer worth the audience. Now, I may be completely wrong because you obviously have a very strong audience. Um, Slider's fan blog is preparing a um, bring back Slider's campaign with a petition at change.org that has something like 4,100 signatures, including mine. And I think when 5,000 signatures have been reached, um, Sliders Fan Blog is going to present it to you, presumably as some sort of uh, pitch tool you know, to use. That's wonderful that you guys are taking the effort to do that, and I very much appreciate it and admire it, and thank you so much. Um, You know, I, I, you know, used to talk with Gene Roddenberry about the incredible effect that the uh, fan base had in changing NBC's mind about the last season of Star Trek. And Gene was, you know, has always had incredible affection for, I guess, what's stupidly called Trekkies. But Mm -hmm. because of that, uh, he's always really appreciated that. And uh, I do too. It's just amazing. And I thank you guys so much. And Um, we're going to try to, you know, if we do come back, we'll try to do something that everyone will be proud of and that they'll be happy with. Um, so, um, thank you again. And, and uh, Gil, I've got to ask you something. Yeah. My wife just stuck a note in front of me. Got to do something for our Thanksgiving, too, and she's freaking out. Uh, okay. So I'm yeah. going to say goodbye to your audience now. Can I ask you, you one more quick question? Of course, sure. Uh, Slider's fan blog says, I feel like a miniseries is the best solution, similar to The Prisoner. And P. Ferreira says, I just want to thank both Cardinalson and Tracy for giving their time to talk about Sliders and not The Prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everybody. You guys are great. I'm really enjoying this. And I will definitely be back for Hammer into Anvil wait to see that one absolutely okay you guys everyone have a great thanksgiving stay safe all right tracy okay thanks thanks guys bye-bye so there you have it from the horse's mouth as it were um I do want to thank everyone uh, in the audience, uh, in the chat, uh, Brian Harnish, Sliders Fan Blog, uh, Rob Altis, P. Ferreira, uh, everybody uh, have a happy and safe Thanksgiving, and uh, tomorrow... My guest will be Tessa B. Dick on Into the Fringe. She was the fifth and last wife of Philip K. Dick and is an amazing writer in her own right. And we will be discussing paranormal slash UFO encounters that both she and Philip K. Dick had. So don't miss tomorrow's episode of Into the Fringe. That's going to be between 7 and 9 o'clock Central. So uh, don't miss that. She's also giving away a copy of her book, uh, Blade Runner Creator Philip K. Dick. And she's going to autograph it for our winner. 
So be here or don't. <laughs> and tomorrow I will have uh, the help of my wonderful mods. And uh, I do want to thank, uh, uh, again, everybody in the chat. Uh, Canadian Spider-Man, Darius Munchausen, Auntie Derivative Jill, of course, and uh, thank you, Rob Altus. Thank you, Brian Harnish, Sliders Fan Blog, and we're over two hours, although we had a bit of a difficult start we made it through and that's what's important so uh, I appreciate everyone's patience and uh, tomorrow we will be uh, between 7 and 9 p.m. Central if I said 5 I was thinking of today uh, between 7 and 9 p.m. tomorrow uh, is the regular time on Thursdays for Into the Fringe. So once you've eaten, once you've watched the big game, be here tomorrow and we're going to hear stories about Philip K. Dick and Tessa B. Dick and their paranormal encounters that probably have never been heard before. So this will be the place to be. Until then, it's Cardinal Sin out. Be safe, everyone.